production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Juvenile Justice and Judge Dan Michael, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Judge Dan Michael from the Juvenile Court of Memphis and Shelby County. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks Along for having me. Absolutely. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. L let's talk about, we'll talk a lot. We'll talk about the, the court, some of the history, right. what the court does, some mm -hmm. of the complications, and mm -hmm. try to, to peel back all the layers of what mm -hmm. goes on in juvenile court and how it's mm -hmm. evolved over time and evolved mm -hmm. in your You've been judged since, what, 2014? 2014. And things have happened since then. Mm -hmm. But for, let me start with this question, almost a fill-in-the-blank question. For, from your point of view, the juvenile court, for kids who go there, it is what for them? Juvenile court is about rehabilitation, period, end of sentence. If you're in trouble with the law as a juvenile, our purpose is to give you direction so that you can rehabilitate your life and become a productive citizen. The law in Tennessee does not use the word punishment when it comes to juvenile court. Now, I know that frustrates a lot of citizens, but what most folks need to understand is we're dealing with children. We're not dealing with adults. Children are not little adults. They function differently. Their brains are different. And the law recognized that before the science caught up to it. Now the science justifies what the law says. So the whole purpose of our our goal in dealing with juvenile delinquency is to give that child a chance to do better. Judge the act, not the child, and get that child on the right track. What age kids go through the juvenile justice system? Yes. Well, technically there's no bottom age, but in the law, a child needs to be old enough to develop the intent. Did a child intend to do the act? Um, arguably, uh, yesterday, yesterday I was coming back from lunch and there was an 11-year-old being brought in. And I asked the young man, I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 11. He was tiny. And I told the uh, law enforcement officers, I said, we're not going to keep him. They're going to send him home, which they did. I don't know what he did. I wasn't going to ask him what he did. Um, the average age coming in is somewhere between 14 and 17. It varies. And the top age is what? Well, it varies. It's 18 or 19 if you commit an act of delinquency before your 18th birthday. And when you say delinquency, I think you mean that in a legalistic term. Yes, As I do. We think, I think delinquency is they skip school. Delinquency is something else in, in your term. That is yeah. correct. Will you define that for us yes. as, as we talk a about A delinquent that? act is an act that would be a crime if you're an adult. Okay. It is a quasi-civil act. It's not a criminal act. So when a child is charged with something as serious as murder, they have committed a delinquent act, not a crime. Okay. We're not a criminal court. We're a juvenile court. Now, there are, you know, there are laws in place that let us deal with those very serious issues. But a delinquent act can only be committed by a child. Okay. A couple more, just again, sort of mm -hmm. uh, the, the universe you live in, and then I'll turn it to Bill for, to get, dig in some more of this. How many kids are there? How many kids go through the juvenile court on a given day, a given year? A given year, um, the averages are somewhere between 4,500 and 6,000. Um, we'll, we'll bump up against 6,000 this year just on delinquent charges. Now, we also have jurisdiction over children who are being abused and neglected. And it's exclusive to juvenile court. Okay. And what the public needs to realize is that those children that we see who are abused and neglected, if we don't break that cycle, they wind they, up on the other side. They come back on the other they side. They come back on the other side. Do, for, for, again, kids who are, do you house kids? I don't know that if that's on We the, have a detention center in the building that's run by the sheriff's department. Okay. And, and they, they might be detained there for days, weeks, years? Uh, never years. Uh, the longest detention might be 200 days before trial. The average length of stays about 38 days. Um, this morning when I got up, we had 90 children in detention. That's going to be my next It's an aberration about this time last year we had about 50. We don't know why we have 90. Right. Um, but 
statistically, right. our numbers vary over the years. Last one, just again, you are mm -hmm. receiving kids from Memphis Me Police Department, Shelby County Sheriff's Department, Bartlett, Arlington, uh, Germantown, Collierville. You Millington. name it. All, all Millington. the municipalities, all, all the police the and, and law enforcement, they come to you. They have to. Yeah. They don't have a choice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bill. Um, so, Judge, uh, in, in June, there was this letter that, that you signed mm -hmm. that uh, Shelby County Mayor Mark Luttrell signed and Sheriff Bill Oldham signed right. to the U.S. Attorney General Jeff mm -hmm. Sessions mm -hmm. um, asking that, that the Justice Department end its oversight, mm -hmm. which began in 2012, mm -hmm. of of juvenile court. Mm -hmm. As we as we record this show, uh, what is the state of that request? Don't know. We've not heard back from the Justice Department. Um, there have been inquiries made. I do know that, but I don't know what the answer is. The last answer I got, I got from NPR, which said they were told they're working on it. So that's as much as I know. Mm -hmm. And let me clarify something, Bill. What the letter actually said was, we're asking, he asked for the letter, Just, General Jeff Sessions yeah. asked for the letter. We sent the letter and the request was, please review our actions under the MOA. And if you agree with us, then we're asking you to terminate the MOA. If Memorandum you disagree with us, mm -hmm. send it back and we'll do what you're asking us to do. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so in, in the interim, the Shelby County Commission has approved a new coordinator Mm -hmm. uh, for for the agreement, basically mm -hmm. someone to oversee, make yes. sure everyone's talking to each other, yes. documents are being exchanged. Yes. yes, And that is retired state criminal appeals court judge Paul Summers. It is. So uh, um, at, at at this point, um, he's getting acclimated. Yes. To, in fact, he agreement. will be in Memphis at our building next Tuesday and mm -hmm. Wednesday to get acclimated. Um, if you'll remember, Bill, uh, Bill Powell was what we call the settlement coordinator in Shelby County. Bill retired, and because we had not heard anything back on the letter, we wanted to stay in compliance. The, the, the memorandum of agreement gives either me or the mayor the authority to uh, ask for who the settlement coordinator is. The mayor had chosen Bill Powell. And I reached out to the mayor and I said, I'd like to choose the next one. And I recommend we choose Paul Summers. Mm -hmm. um, the mayor was thrilled with that idea. And evidently Paul was too, because we had a meeting with General Summers. We went through the details. He was obviously well studied on the issue um, and agreed that if the county commission would go through with the process, he would take the position. So if, if General Sessions comes back and says, mm -hmm. I, I agree with the request you, mm -hmm. you have made. Mm -hmm. That's not the end of the memorandum of agreement. There is, in effect, a wind-down period. No. Is there not? Or it, that's it? It would be it. That would be it. Paul would be out of a job. Okay. It, yeah. it, it, can we back up? I'm going to put this on you because this memorandum we're talking about predates your election. It does. As a judge. Mm -hmm. And so, Bill, can you do a quick background on what, what, why the federal government got involved and what they were concerned about and where this memorandum between the justice, the federal justice department, Shelby County, and the court came about? Uh, sure. The justice department uh, did a, uh, an investigation over several mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. of juvenile court at the request mm -hmm. of County Commissioner Henry Brooks. Uh, and and came back with some findings and said there are, we see issues there are due process issues in the court there are a lot of things that we think need fixing um, ordinarily the next step might be to go into file some kind of lawsuit in right. federal court that's not what happened here Shelby County government juvenile court right. uh, entered into a settlement agreement that had very specific and many conditions to it for this is how we agree to improve things. This is how we agree to continue to monitor things going forward to fix these problems. Mm -hmm. Those problems, you mentioned due process. There was also, there was a lot of emphasis on what they, I think they termed disproportionate minority content. Yeah, equal protection. Mm -hmm. There are three areas under the memorandum of agreement. Equal protection, due process, and uh, safety from harm, which is the detention center. Um, and, and questions he, about how kids are being treated. Yes. In that yes. Center. I mean, real, yes. real. Well, question mm -hmm. of, questions about how children were being treated, period. Okay. Not just in the detention center. There were no allegations of abuse 
in the detention center. But restraint chairs that, that were questioned. And that were like purchased that. with money from the Department of Justice. Okay. Let me make that clear. Yeah. Restraint chairs at one time were an approved system right. by the Department of Justice. Things change over time, obviously. When they ask us to get rid of it, we got rid of it right away. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that you and am I right in saying that the, the in the around the time you guys wrote the letter, mm -hmm. at, as you say, the request of mm -hmm. General Sessions, the Monitor had come out and said that a lot of the term, the, a lot of the, the points in the agreement mm -hmm. had been met. Certain yes. things had been fixed, yes. but certain things had not. Yes. Why is there a? I think critics have said there's a, there's this urgency to get rid of the federal monitor. Is there an urgency to get rid of the federal? No. Monitor? Okay. No. So in, in the Paul Summers role, again, mm -hmm. back just to mm -hmm. get in the weeds on mm -hmm. this, is an outcome of that um, that agreement from the yes, 2012 yes. memorandum the, of understanding. The that settlement, somebody in there who is yes. accountable to yes. everyone yes. and say, hey, these things are being addressed and these right. things aren't. Exactly. Okay. That is his role under the MOA. Without him, let's say everything, you know, he signs off, the Justice Department yeah. lets it go. Who oversees the court? I mean, everyone yeah. has, you, who oversees, you, who, the where voters. are the checks and balances? Voters. The Court of Appeals, the yeah. Supreme Court. Okay. Yeah. And if, uh, again, if I, you know, if, if, if a child goes through the juvenile court, they are, let's say they're not somebody who can afford a lawyer online. Mm -hmm. Who represents them? A lawyer. But from a public defender's office or a the volunteer first appointment, or someone on your staff? No, the or, first appointment work? will be a public defender. Under the law in Tennessee, under Rule 13, if you're indigent and you cannot afford an attorney, the court shall maintain a roster of qualified attorneys to appoint to indigent defendants if the public defender is conflicted. So your first appointment is the public defender. Okay. Now, up until this agreement, we did not have the public defender. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, okay. that, that can, no, keep going, keep yeah. going. I think, because that's had, a new thing that the public defender's office is back to the is correct. court. That is correct. We use panels, just like the federal government does in the federal courts. You apply to be a, a, a lawyer on a panel at the federal court, you apply to be on a panel at juvenile court. Okay. You're vetted, you're put on the docket, and you're assigned cases under the law. And a child comes in, mom can't afford a lawyer, then we pick a, an attorney off the panel. It's all done by computer. But not a, not a public defender. That's Before the, the public defender came in. Okay. And that was one of the conflicts that DOJ did not like. Um, now, since the public defender has come in, those number of panel attorneys have dropped because they're handling about 65% of the caseload. They have conflicts. So if they have represented Dan Michael and Bill Drees before, and Bill was represented by private counsel, Dan gets in trouble again, it can conflict them out, which means we now have to have two private attorneys, okay? So they get conflicted out on, you know, co-defendant cases, multiple cases, on a regular basis. And they come in and they say, Your Honor, we can't represent Bill, they can't represent right. me because of the conflict. And we'll reach out to the panel and pick an attorney. Are you, I'll go, then I'll go to Bill. Are you comfortable that in this new world, again, mm -hmm. which was put in place in mm -hmm. 2012 agreement, yeah. and you've lived with, you were a magistrate before you were elected. I was, correct? So yeah. You worked mm -hmm. within the juvenile. I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you're elected. Are you comfortable that there are, that, that the, the kids who come through have access to adequate counsel? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Bill. And on, on the question of disproportionate minority contact, yeah. um, is, is a, an African-American child who comes to juvenile court, are they treated harsher? Are they treated uh, more severely mm -hmm. than a white child who is there for the same reason? I can only answer that on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? The, the answer that the Justice Department came up with was that African-American children are treated more harshly than Caucasian children who come into the court system. Well, when 98% of the kids that come into the court system are African-American, the percentage of those kids that get harsher judgments is going to be higher. It's a statistical fact. You can't change that. 88% of the children that we receive at juvenile court come from inside the city limits of Memphis which is a majority African-American city. What, 67%, I believe? We have very few children coming in from the outlying jurisdictions. Now, by law, if a child burglarizes a home in Germantown, Germantown police can't keep him in Germantown. They have to transport him to juvenile court. And I try to explain this to the, the public when I'm out there. Here's the difference. 
The difference is in poverty, the difference is in resources, the difference is in privilege, the, the difference is in transportation. Let's take two kids. Let's take one from Germantown, two-parent household, does something really stupid. Now let's take a kid from Frazier. The only adult he has in his home is his mom, and he's got three siblings. He doesn't know his dad. I see this every day. The case calls, comes before the court. Child's been taken into custody, brought to juvenile court, standing before a judge for a detention hearing. Having done, in your scenario, and I hate to interrupt because mm -hmm. this is very interesting, mm -hmm. having done what level of offense? And we're talking about, let's, in your example, aggravated we're talking about burglary. the kid from aggravated, aggravated burglary. Burglary. And they we're broke talking into about a the, home. The, the, kid, the kid from Germantown and the, the African American kid. They from both Frazier. did ag burglaries. Okay. Okay. okay, it's a felony. They come in there before the judge. You take the kid from Frazier, his mama may or may not be there. He's 15. You think as a judge, I'm going to release that 15 year old back to the community when there's not an adult to take him? I can't do that. That would be abandoning that child to the street. So he's going to get detained. Now, this is his first offense. Now, mom may show up later that evening and say, I was at work. I couldn't leave. I get fired, which is a common problem with moms who are trying to support four kids with no help from dad. Or she may have been in the courtroom and said, he can't come home. Why? He's, he's ruining my other three kids. They're younger than he is. He's out on the street. He won't come home at night. He's all kinds of trouble. It happens on a regular basis. So, so is that then a failing of the system that there isn't an alternative? For, no, for, no, it's for, a failing of the society that we're dealing with. But, but, but it's landed <coughs> in your lap to yeah. do something, yeah. Yeah. something yeah. with it. And are, that's my frustration. Are, 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 you, are you limited in what you can yes. do as juvenile court yes. judge for that? Yes, for that absolutely. One of my frustrations and one of the reasons that I was willing to sign off on this agreement, when, when DOJ came in and made their findings in April of 2012, there was a team meeting of all the senior level folks at juvenile court, and Curtis Person asked the question. He said, we've got two choices. We either sign this agreement or we go to court. Go home, sleep on it, be back here in the morning, give us your decision. Curtis Person being your predecessor. He was my predecessor. He was my judge at that time. We all came back in the office the next morning, and he polled us one by one. Everybody agreed to the MOA. We didn't agree what was in it, but we agreed to do the MOA because we felt as a public organization, the best way to resolve these problems was to not fight it out in court and cost the citizens millions of dollars and time. We felt we could resolve the problems working with the Department of Justice and their lawyers. And we think we have. The problem we've got to now, though, is that they created such a firestorm with their findings in a city that is as raw as Memphis is on racial issues, that every time they come to Memphis and they stand before the cameras, they raise the ire of problems over and over and over again. My issue as the judge is, we've got, we got problems in Memphis. I'm born and raised here. This is my home. You can't put it all on the juvenile court. We know where the problems come from. If you want to focus on solving the problems, you have to get rid of the diversion that, in my mind, a lot of the naysayers are using as an excuse not to address the hard work. The diversion being what? The MOA. Oh, I got you. D distract. Diversion it's a distraction. Sense, I, I thought you meant, meant legal diversion from... Distraction. Course, it's, a, a distraction. it's a distraction. So, a, a couple of things. One, you know, you talk about this, the, the rawness of these issues in Memphis, but, I mean, you look around nationally but <laughs> in the last couple of years since yeah. Ferguson, since all yeah. the, the police yeah. shootings, yeah. The, since Charlottesville more yeah. recently. There, yeah. the, it's a country that has a lot of raw um, racial issues that go into the criminal justice system. And, and, and back to your scenario of the kid from Germantown and the kid from yeah. Frazier. Um, I'm fascinated by that. We've had lots mm -hmm. of people on before yeah. talking about these issues of yeah. the first touch yeah. with the criminal justice yeah. system. Yeah. So back to your scenario yeah. for a second. When that child who you say, look, I can't, I've decided I can't send him home. Mom's right. not here. Right. Mom is saying, right. he, we don't, don't send him back. Right. He's, he's right. a problem. Right. What are your options then? Keep him till trial. And what does that mean for the, his life will be what? 
He will be in. He will be in, his, in, a, his, in a prison outfit. He will be on bars. I mean, really, kind of get into what does he, that mean for him? He is in a secured detention facility inside juvenile court. He will be assigned a single room detention room. He won't share a bunk with anybody. He'll be in a room by himself. He'll be in school every day. School is open. We have a school up there. All right, Hope Academy. He will be fed three times a day, and he'll have several snacks a day. He'll be able to make phone calls every day. He can visit his family. He can visit his lawyers. He will wear a uniform, more or less, that we provide that is ascribed to by the federal folks for suicide right. prevention. Right? You can't give them belts. You can't give them shoelaces, sure. things like that. What do, what about, we have about five minutes left. Okay. And again, I think this, I hope that, I find this fascinating. Because yeah. I think the understanding, okay, those, yeah. those they're, they're, let's assume for a second that care and feeding is, is taken care yeah. of. Yeah. What about, back to how you opened the show, yeah. rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. He's, as he's waiting for mm -hmm. trial, mm -hmm. what, what, if anything, mm -hmm. is being done, can mm -hmm. be done mm -hmm. to, whether it's mental health, right. whether it's morals training, whether yeah. it's whatever it yeah. is yeah. that is starting that path of rehabilitation. Yeah. Is there anything that you all can do or that you We can? are doing okay. every day. We have groups come in from the community that talk to the young men. We have a psychologist on staff. We have medical care all the way up to a child psychiatrist. So if they're having problems, you need glasses and you've lost your glasses, we'll get you glasses so you can read. Now, the rehabilitation starts after trial. Because if you're not convicted, you go home. You've been acquitted. But if you are found to have committed the delinquent act, that's when the really hard work starts. And one of the key components of rehabilitation is having a parent or parents to buy into the hard work it's going to take to take that child and give him the chance he deserves. Well, I'll go to Bill. Just a few yeah. minutes left here. Um, so it, it, at the outset of this, you said that the, the juvenile court under Judge Person, yeah. you all did not agree with, with the, the, the findings that the Justice Department came back with. We did not. So do, do you understand why there is some skepticism sure. for, Absolutely. from the critics about what happens if the DOJ Absolutely. goes away? Absolutely. And I think there's a big misunderstanding. You have to read, the, you have to read it. The, the language that African-American children are treated harsher than Caucasian children comes from what they call the RRI. It is a statistical database that they use to determine treatment of children based on race. The only people that use the RRI is the Department of Justice. Most people who hear about this think the juvenile court got sued. We did not get sued. We went into an agreement with the Department of Justice. These were lawyers who came in. And I've heard this said before, but they made findings. So what? I make findings every day. My findings are reviewed by the Court of Appeals. My findings are reviewed by the Supreme Court. Who reviews the DOJ's findings in a memorandum of agreement? Do the no one. Do the monitors, though, who, who are supposed to be independent of everyone, mm -hmm. What role do you think they play? Do you think they have been objective? No, I do not. Just very bluntly, I do not. Michael Lieber will tell you. He's from the University of Florida. I like Michael. He's a good guy, but he's a statistician. He'll tell you he's paid his house off on the money he's made working as an independent monitor for the Department of Justice. Sandra Simpkins, who's a law professor at Rutgers, who teaches clinic up there, his first time as a, as a monitor. I will tell you that her reports mimic what she's told by the Department of Justice lawyers. Neither are independent. Well, again, we, we talked about this before, but I want to go back to it. it, it with the, with the, if, if the monitors went away, if the, the memorandum of, of right. agreement was gone, right. again, that accountability for people who say, look, I want to know who, who is Judge Michael accountable to? Who is that court system accountable to? Is it just the voters? Because yeah. a lot of people don't vote, and yeah. a lot of people don't, yeah. you know, they're not engaged yeah. in the process in that yeah. way. You have an eight-year term. Yeah, I So do. if they disagree with you, they've got to wait six years to, to, to vote you out of office. They Should there be more? They have to wait six years, or they have to come in and file a complaint with the Board of okay. the Judiciary that I'm not doing my job okay. properly. Right. And have the Board remove me. 
Um, back to the scenario that I keep coming back to. Sure. I think this is fascinating stuff. And sure. We've talked about a lot with, with other people about criminal justice and, and, and how people get in the system. Yeah. Take your scenario down from an aggravated uh, burglary okay. to, to a delinquency from school. What I think of as a layman's term delinquency right. or you know, someone who is just out and about. Okay. Is your court the appropriate place for a kid from Fraser or a kid from Germantown mm -hmm. to go if they have, quote, violated the law by not being in school. No. I mean, for those, but, and yet, do you no, get those kids? We do, because the law is structured that way, but the, I don't believe it's correct. Okay. You have to understand something. This year, if we get somewhere close to 6,000 delinquent referrals, only about 2,000 of those will get before a judge. All those other kids will be pushed out of the system through diversion. It doesn't mean nothing will happen. What it means is the resources we apply to them does not involve a courtroom. But do police, because you don't, you can't say that the police, we only have a couple seconds left, mm -hmm. so we'll have to have you back. Mm -hmm. Are the police bringing you too many kids who have done low level offenses that really aren't appropriate, that, that shouldn't be going into the criminal justice system? Not enough time to answer, but. Uh, N not as bad as it used to be. It's okay. much, much better. Okay, we will have yeah. you back and we'll talk okay. all that through some more. Right. I really enjoyed Sounds it. Good. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night. differently, their brains are different, and the law recognized that before the science caught up to it. Now the science justifies what the law says. So the whole purpose of a, our, our goal in dealing with juvenile delinquency is to give that child a chance to do better. Judge the act, not the child, and get that child on the right track. What age kids go through the juvenile justice system? Yes. Well, technically there's no bottom age. But in the law, a child needs to be old enough to develop the intent. Did a child intend to do the act? Um, arguably, uh, yesterday, yesterday I was coming back from lunch and there was an 11 year old being brought in. And I asked the young man, I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 11, he was tiny. And I told the uh, law enforcement officers, I said, we're not gonna keep him. They're gonna send him home. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Juvenile Justice and Judge Dan Michael, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Judge Dan Michael from the Juvenile Court of Memphis and Shelby County. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks Along for with, having me. Absolutely. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. L let's talk about, we'll talk a lot. We'll talk about the, the court, some of the history, right. what the court does. Now, there are, you know, there are laws in place that let us deal with those very serious issues. But a delinquent act can only be committed by a child. Okay. A couple more, just again, sort of mm -hmm. uh, the, the universe you live in, and then I'll turn it mm -hmm. to Bill for, to get, dig in some more of this. How many kids are there? How many kids go through the juvenile court on a given day, a given year? A given year, um, the averages are somewhere between 4,500 and 6,000. Um, we'll, we'll bump up against 6,000 this year just on delinquent charges. Now, we also have jurisdiction over children who are being abused and neglected. And it's exclusive to juvenile court. Okay. And what the public needs to realize is that those children that we see who are abused and neglected, if we don't break that cycle, they wind they, up on the other side. They come back on the other they side. They come back on the other side. Do, for, for, again, kids who are, do you house kids? I don't know. Which they did. I don't know what he did. I wasn't going to ask him what he did. Um, the average age coming in is somewhere between 14 and 17. It varies. And the top age is what? Well, it varies. It's 18 or 19 if you commit an act of delinquency before your 18th birthday. And when you say delinquency, I think you mean that in a legalistic term. Yes, as I do. We think, I think delinquency is they skip school. 
Delinquency is something else in, in your terms. That is yeah. correct. Will you define that for us yes. as, as we talk a about A delinquent that? act is an act that would be a crime if you're an adult. Okay. It is a quasi-civil act. It's not a criminal act. So when a child is charged with something as serious as murder, they have committed a delinquent act, not a crime. Okay. We're not a criminal court. We're a juvenile court. Some of the complications and try to, to peel back all the layers of what goes on in juvenile court and how it's evolved over time and evolved mm -hmm. in your You've been judged since, what, 2014? 2014. And things have happened since then. Mm -hmm. But for, let me start with this question, almost a fill-in-the-blank question. For, from your point of view, the juvenile court, for kids who go there, it is what for them? Juvenile court is about rehabilitation, period, end of sentence. If you're in trouble with the law as a juvenile, our purpose is to give you direction so that you can rehabilitate your life and become a productive citizen. The law in Tennessee does not use the word punishment when it comes to juvenile court. Now, I know that frustrates a lot of citizens, but what most folks need to understand is we're dealing with children. We're not dealing with adults. Children are not little adults. They function.